if you've ever seen one of those fractal zoom videos, you know how fascinating they are. They all just seem to go on forever, and it's not like anybody designed this, it's all based on math. I wanted to learn how to make this, so let's get to the video. We'll be looking at one of the most popular factors today, called the Mandelbrot set. The basic idea is this, we have an x-axis and a y-axis. Now, we divide this into all of the pixels that we want to draw. For each pixel, we'll take the x-axis and then add the y-axis plus an i to make it a complex number called c. Now, we square it and then add c again. Then we square it and add c again and so on. Now, there are two possibilities here. Either the number eventually gets big enough to escape off into infinity, or it just stays near zero jumping around forever. If it does stay here forever, we color it black. But if it does escape after a certain number of iterations, then we need to give it a color. There are a few algorithms for coloring the Mandelbrot set, such as linear coloring, histogram coloring, fractional escape, exterior distance estimation, interior distance estimation, and so on. But I don't really understand most of this, so for today, we're just going to be using the square root coloring, which is the same type of coloring that some of the deep zoom videos already use. We take the number of iterations, square root it, and then place that on a looping gradient, which gives our color. The reason why we square root it is to keep the color consistent. Otherwise, the color will change too fast when we are in a very deep zoom, like you can see right here. I'm going to use C for this project. Let's start by creating complex numbers using two doubles in the struct. And then I'm just going to be creating a few helper functions to help us add, multiply, and square complex numbers like we do on pencil and paper and in high school algebra. As you can see, we start off another complex number, z, with 0, then every iteration, we square it and then add c to it. If it manages to escape, then we can give it a color depending on how long it took to do so, using square root coloring. If it doesn't escape however, after a certain number of iterations, we'll just give it black. And voila, just like that, the Mandelbrot set appears. Pretty cool, right? Now, it renders pretty fast for this first image, but the deeper you zoom, the more iterations you need, and so it gets very slow very quickly. Now, factor rendering is what's known as an embarrassingly parallel problem, which is an actual technical term, which means that it is super easy to do things like calculate all of the pixels at the same time. My M1 MacBook Air has 8 cores, so I divided the screen up into 8 portions, one for each core. Here it is in action. You can see that it renders a lot faster, and I also made the bottom tiles render backwards, which gives it a cool looking effect. But as it turns out, even that was not fast enough if you're rendering at high resolutions, so I added a preview mode as well. If I find something I like, I can just press tab, and it will render the full thing for me. I really like flying through these fractals. It feels like a 2D adventure game like Ori and the Blind Forest or something. Oh, whoa, what's this? At 10 to the power of 15 zoom, it seems that we have reached our limit, which is not nearly as deep as those zooms that you want to recreate. Why is that? First, we have to talk about how computers handle doubles or floating points. In scientific notation, you don't write 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, or 0 0.12345. 2, 3, 4, 5. Instead, you write 1.2345 times 10 to the power of 4, or 10 to the power of negative 1. That's basically what's happening with computers as well. We store 1.2345 in what's called the Mantisa in binary, and then we store the exponents here, also in binary. And then there's just a sign bit, which tells us if the number is positive or negative. 
Now, doubles use 52 bits for the Mantisa, which means that if we keep the exponent fixed, it can only store 2 to the power of 52 different numbers. We literally can't go more precise than that, because there's just not enough bits to go around. And 2 to the power of 52 is almost the same as 10 to the power of 15. So yeah, doubles are limiting us here. In comparison, if you want to zoom to like 10 to the power of 1000, we literally need like 3000 bits. So yeah, obviously our only course of action is to reinvent floating points. Here's the plan. We'll use an array of 464-bit unsigned integers that will act like one giant 256-bit number, and then we'll add a signed bit somewhere in there. We don't need an exponent because we're just going to be dealing with numbers between 0 and 2, so we can just assume that the decimal point is between the first and the second integer. This is known as fixed point, but I'll just call it big floats because big fix just sounds weird. For instance, if we want to add two numbers together, we'll start by adding on the right hand side, and if it's too big, we'll add one to the next column, like a carry. This is kind of what you learn in school, but instead of each digit being from 0 to 9, you have 0 to 18 quintillion. Here's how it looks like in code. C doesn't allow us to access the carry flag, so we're using inline ARM assembly instead. Here, we add the first two integers, and then we need to tell the CPU to set the carry flag if needed. Then, we'll just use the add with carry instructions to add the next two integers, and so on, all the way until the end. Multiplication is a bit harder, but it's still what you learn in school. We just multiply all of the integers together, adding zeros at the end as necessary. Then, we add all of it together, but now you realize that this is 8 integers instead of 4. Since our decimal point is always at a fixed position, we can just take the second integer all the way to the fifth, so no big deal there. Now all we have to do is to change from doubles to our own big flows, add in a few functions and so on. After a few failed attempts, you could not imagine how happy I was to finally see this Mandelbrot set again, this time using our own custom super precise numbers. While theoretically we could go to infinity with this, my CPU was already burning enough at 256 bits, so this will do for now. You can see how I had to switch to click to zoom instead of the keyboard, because the program was just running too slowly to use the keyboard to navigate. It was at this point that I decided to try switching over to the GPU. Big mistake. This is a certified hood classic. It's about oh, it's about bruh. It's about oh my god. It's about it's about That aside, it turns out that my big floats were so complicated they actually ran slower on the GPU. After some more research, it seems like a lot of the deep zoom renderers out there tend to use a CPU because big floats just don't work well with the graphics card. So yeah, I gave up on that and went back to the CPU. Now, I could explore the factor manually, but what I really wanted to do at the start of this video is to render those deep zoom videos. So I added some code to automatically do that for me, turn it on, and here's the result. Now, there's still a lot of things that can be improved, such as better optimization, more precision, not wasting an entire 64 bits, or a better formula for calculating the number of iterations that we need. But this is good enough for now. You can find the source code and download links in the description below. The code is fully documented, so I encourage you to play around with it and learn more from it. It's also completely free and open source, so you can use it to just play around or even make your own deep zoom videos. Thanks for joining me on this journey, and I hope you've enjoyed my first coding devlog. I would really like a like or a subscribe because it will really help get the attention of the YouTube algorithm and I will be able to make more for the future. If you have any questions, you can also leave a comment and I will try to answer it to the best of my ability. Alright, that's about it. See you next time.